Suicide, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. The statistics tell us that the overall suicide rate in Australia at the moment is currently sitting at 12.6 people per 100,000. That means that over 3,000 Australians are uh, committing suicide each and every year. And the male population, it's three times what it is for the females. But there is something we can do to help. We need to reduce the stigma associated with mental illness and demystify the process for getting help. It all starts with a simple conversation with your general practitioner, but it ends with you getting the help that you need. My name is Craig Marchant, and I grew up in a small country town called Tilma Bay in New South Wales. I was uh, one of three kids, I'm the eldest, and I've got a younger brother and a younger sister. Uh, and we were always graced with having a lot of family around. Uh, so I grew up with both sets of grandparents, um, uh, my uh, uncles, aunts, cousins, you name it, everyone sort of lived into Norba Bay, which is really weird when I think about it now, actually. <laughs> um, so, you know, we were always blessed with having, you know, family arrangements and gatherings and all that, so that was all really good. And uh, those are probably the first 12 years of my life are probably what I feel were the best of my life to begin with. Um, you know, I would remember various, uh, I've remembered various things over the years, one of them being that, um, you know, my grandfather would always come up every morning while we were getting ready for school and we'd be at the, the, you know, the dinner table having breakfast and the next thing I'd hear, you'd hear the gate open, the gate shut, get out of your dog, what are you doing? And that was his little cat crying, you just knew at that point he was here. Um, you know, and, and something else that I found humorous in later years, not so much at the time, uh, was my brother and I were a bit of mischievous, shall we say, and we were out in the garage and we managed to find his air rifle. So we decided that it would be a clever idea to put nails into the barrel and fire them at the garage door. And of course, this got his attention and he came out and we started running. And what I didn't know at the time and now makes sense is my grandmother said to him, I knew old fool, stop, they'll come to you. And sure enough, he was right. She was right because I, we, my brother and I both ran around the house. We ran straight into her. I can tell you now, we never did that again. <laughs> never ever did that again. Uh, unfortunately, we lost my grandfather when I was 12. He uh, had a massive heart attack and just died in his sleep. Which is probably, if you're going to go, it's probably one of the better ways. He apparently never felt anything. Um, I always, I took it really hard and I felt that I was responsible. And you might be asking yourself, why, why would I be responsible? So, I, on that day, it was Father's Day, to boot, just to add in a bit more, um, and I had the option of either going with Dad and my brother to watch football, or to stay with Grandfather, and, and not that I would stay with Grandfather, I wasn't exactly a big football person, I never, never really got into it too much, and so I thought if I had been there, I might have been able to do something. Turns out that wasn't going to happen, but, you know, a 12-year-old doesn't really have those mature thought processes at that point in time. Um, so, as I said, I took that really hard and uh, that was really, when I look back at it, that was what started my depression at that point. Um, you know, I was, you know, the, the, I remember the teacher having a, a well-meaning conversation with my mother saying, oh, he just needs to snap out of it. And of course, as we know, you can't just snap out of depression. If it did, Oh, I, I would be so sad, I'm ready for it. But unfortunately, it just didn't work that way. Uh, so anyway, we, you know, at that age, I was getting ready to go into high school, um, and I chose a local high school, local for us, uh, in Newcastle, which was the closest space. So we would travel on the bus for an hour each day, each way, uh, just to get to school. So we'd start at seven, get in there about 8.30, because it was the workers' bus. Uh, and then the same in reverse, you know, we get that back about five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and that's when my panic attack started, at, just as I started high school. So I would seriously, I would just be walking along and I just collapse. That's it, just fall straight down. So, um, you know, I was in hospital, I was in hospital for about two or three weeks and they were doing every test under the sun to try and work out what was going on. 
and all the tests would keep coming back perfectly clear. There's no, there's no problem, he's fine. And I remember my mum having a conversation with the doctor saying, could it be depression? And he laughed it off and said, oh, kids that young don't get depression. Well, as we all know, that's not true anymore either. They've now proved that yes, young children can actually get depression. Um, so, you know, high school went through, uh, I remember, you know, I had some good times there. Um, I was a library monitor, so I would hide myself away in the library um, you know, and keep out of the reach of everyone else because I just wasn't really interested in socialising, never been a social butterfly. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I remember one thing, I've always been really good with computers. So, um, I was at high school at the time um, and we were in one of the computer programming classes and I had discovered in early life that if I modified one of the Space Invader files <laughs> for the old Space Invaders game, I don't know if anyone's ever played it before, it would actually reboot the whole machine. So it must have been some sort of buffer overrun or something clever like that. I didn't know at the time. I just thought, hey, this is cool. You run this file and the computer reboots. And so um, I decided I was going to be naughty that day. I was bored out of my skull. I'm not going to lie. I was, there was nothing to do. So I built a program that would log on to the school's network, message every machine four or five times, and then it would delete all evidence of itself and then run that file and reboot so the computer was clear. You could never tell who did it. <laughs> and I, I went out to the toilet and I set it up on a timer and went off and I was just actually standing outside just hiding behind the classroom and I heard every computer going ding 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 ding, ding, ding everywhere and then I'd come back in and they're just going crazy little shit. I know you did it. I can't prove it but I know you did it. <laughs> so I got, I got up to a bit of mischief at school. Let's just say I, I enjoyed my computers over the years. Um, so anyway, I got to uh, you know, end of high school, I finished up at the end of year 10 because as I said, I was just bored with, with it, you know, that nothing really took my attention. Um, so I finished up at the end of year 10 and actually went into the workforce. Um, and, you know, things were still plodding along with my depression at that point. Um, I got, to, I got uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia as well when I was about 17 or 18. Um, so I still managed to keep it all together for a while up until about 2002, and then the wheels just fell straight off. Um, unfortunately, I uh, got to a point where I was trying to commit suicide a number of times. Must have happened probably 10 or 15 times. Uh, I would never realise when I was doing it, which was the scary part for me, I'd be looking at medication pills that were, you know, medication packets that were empty of pills. Ugh, I've done it again. You know, you have to go into hospital, you know, have, have a delightful charcoal drink, which I really don't recommend to anyone if you don't do it, not nice. Um, you know, and that kept happening on and off for a while. The schizophrenia was playing up, so I would hear things and I would see things. Uh, and it was actually a one time when I was actually a little more successful than usual with the medication and it took a bit longer to get into the hospital. And they put me in the ICU that time because of like, we've got to monitor your vitals, this, you know, it's been in your system a bit longer than it the good. Um, so we, um, I'm laying in the bed there at that point and uh, I overheard a conversation between a nurse and one of the patients and he was saying that he didn't want to die, he wasn't ready to go yet. Now this was an older gentleman. So I, upon hearing that, there's suddenly something hit me that I've never really thought of before. I was in a room full of people who wanted to live, and I was the sole exception. I was trying to get out of life. And that really hit me hard. And I never got to actually thank the gentleman because that's what I credit with actually pulling me out and getting me started on my journey to getting well. You know, he passed away unfortunately that night, which was really sad for me because he, he doesn't, I don't, you know, he never would have realised that such powerful words at that time landed with me so well. So anyway, I got out of hospital and I realised that, you know, I wasn't going to do this anymore. So it took a couple of years uh, until I managed to get things where I thought were pretty much under control. Um, so I, I met my first wife, Kim, in 2005. And we got married in 2006 and I had uh, my first daughter, Chelsea, uh, in 2006 and then my second daughter, Jasmine, in 2007. 
uh, and then my uh, son Zachary uh, in 2009. And you know we were we were pretty happy together, but unfortunately it didn't last uh, as marriages do sometimes. And so we broke up and went our own ways in December of 2010. Um, back in and then in 2011, I met my second wife Kendall, uh, and we got married in 2014, and we had. Uh, two children, Aiden and Jace. Aiden's four and Jace is two. Uh, and things have been going you know, relatively well at that time. I was pretty happy with everything. Um, in 2008, I actually had started a new business with a couple of mates. Uh, Shock Horror was an IT company. Um, it was a web hosting, a web hosting and domain name company. Um, actually, it's one of the largest privately held companies now uh, for web hosting and domain names in Australia. And uh, we were working insane hours like I am talking you know we would be um, we would be you know working during the day and then you know in the night time we'd be going into the data center to um, you know install a new server or fix a network or something like that you know it was we were working probably realistically I'd say probably 16 16 to 18 hour days so that went on for a couple of years, and it was it was hard work. You know, it was a lot of hard work, uh, but we really I was still enjoying it, which I guess is good. Um, and uh, so the company kept growing, and we moved into a new. We were just working out of my mate's house at that point, so we moved into a new office. Lasted twelve months in that office, and had to upgrade to something even bigger because of the massive growth we were undertaking. And so everything went along really well, uh, and we got to 2015 actually, and uh, I was feeling a little lost actually at that point. Um, a lot of my daily challenges had disappeared, so there was a lot of challenges in the early startup phase. By that time, we'd gotten to you know, a relatively easygoing, you know, routine, and we had staff and we had people that could help. So um, I was talking to my mum, and she talked mentioned to me how she had just finished doing um, signing up for um, planned cycle for the girls in Cambodia and Vietnam um, and that was to raise funds for um, helping the girls get their educations over in those countries because generally speaking it's the males who get the funding uh, you know and go through school and the females you know miss out so you know mum was telling me how amazing this trek was and um, you know I was looking for something to do and so um, she pointed me in the direction of um, a company called Inspired Adventures and uh, I was looking for something to do obviously and I found one that was trekking the Inca Trail in Peru for the Leukemia Foundation and you've got to remember at that stage I was rel relatively still heavy set, I was about 150 kilos or so and I didn't know how I was going to do it but I just knew I was going to do it and so I signed up we got to May of 2016 and I'm flying over there and I'm thinking, what have I done? <laughs> what have I actually got myself into here? But all the people were lovely in that. Um, you know, we flew into Cusco uh, and due to its high elevation, uh, it take, need a couple of days to acclimatise to, you know, how high it up it is because obviously there's less oxygen the higher you get, which means you get altitude sickness, which is not pleasant. Um, so we acclimatised over a few days. And then we got to the start of the trek, and we were at the at the sort of the little camp beforehand. We had lunch. Uh, we made our way to the checkpoint, and then crossed over the bridge onto the Inca Trail itself. Uh, and we trekked for I think it was about three or four hours, uh, and we got down into a, a valley, and we that's where the camp was set up. And so we had we were camped sort of over the river next to the ruins there. Um, and so that was really nice and we got to know each other that night and you know had dinner and that sort of stuff and then went to bed and then the second day is really where it hit me really hard. The morning was relatively simple, you know, it was, it was fairly easy at that point but then we started to hit where the elevation starts. And I got to, it would be about mid-morning and I was feeling pretty seedy at that point. Um, I had a little bit of altitude sickness um, on, on myself at that moment. Um, and I was actually considering giving up. It was just like, I think you're not going to be able to do this if you're dying now. <laughs> you know, what's, what's it going to be like when you get even higher up into these high elevations? 
And actually the guy pulled me to the side and I was telling him, you see, look Craig, yeah, you could give up on it. You can go back and you can take the train and meet us at Machu Picchu, which was the ultimate destination. Um, but he said, I've seen people heavier and more unfit than you complete this. And I, be I believe you can do this, I believe in you. No one ever said to me in my life that they believed in me. No one, you know, it's just, a, just one of those things. And that really hit a chord with me. And I was like, oh my God, maybe I can do this. And so we kept doing the second day and we were climbing up and up and I was hanging back at the rear a lot of the, a lot of the trip um, until we got to the campsite on the second day. And I was so proud of myself. I was like, oh my God, I actually did it. I kept going. I didn't give up on myself. And I managed to finish day two. We camped the night. We got to day three and the guy comes to me and says, Craig, we're going to have a challenge for you today. He said, you're going to be up front. I'm keeping you up front. We're going to start about 20 minutes, half an hour earlier than everyone else. And we're going to keep going and you're going to be the leader of the pack. And so that's what happened the entire day. Um, you know, we got to, um, well, most of the day, we got to our lunch point and I was, you know, we, we'd gone up really high, we'd come back down, we'd gone up really high again and come back down. Uh, we had lunch and of course it started to rain, so I was feeling cold, wet, and miserable at that point. And uh, we were still a good two hours off the campsite at that point. So the rest of the team went ahead and I was, um, I was at the rear with the guide. And so I trudged into camp about 7.30 at night. <laughs> I had my headlight on, um, you know, so I could actually see where I was going. And it was funny, everyone was lined up on the side of the road and was, you know, clapping me and saying, well, well done. And I was just like, oh, this is amazing. Like, you know, of course I hadn't seen any of the scenery at that point. I was more interested in actually just laying down. <laughs> I was so tired. <laughs> uh, and so you know, I had, had a little bit of dinner and then went back to sleep. Uh, and then, but when I woke up in the morning, I saw why they called it Cloud City and it was, we were actually camping above the clouds. So the clouds were down here and we were camped here. And it was just amazing. I was like, oh my, like look at, you know, we could watch, you know, we were seeing snow, uh, mountain snow peaks and it was just absolutely amazing. Uh, and so, you know, we, we finished off, you know, we said goodbye to our quarter team at that point on, uh, on the fourth day. Um, and we, you know, we kept going until we got to what they affectionately call the Gringo Killer Stairs. And I couldn't figure out what that was all about at the time. But I, but I, do, I know exactly why it is now. Because <laughs> when you get to these stairs, they just go like that. They're very, very straight up. So, you know, I had no choice in the matter. I had to get up these things. And so dignity was just cast aside. And I just scrambled up on my hands and my knees. I didn't care how I was going to do it. I just knew that that's what I was going to do. Um, and so we got to the top of those stairs and, oh, you know, and then I think we trekked for, I think it was about another hour and we finally got to the sundial up at Machu Picchu. So we're overlooking Machu Picchu from up high and it was just a really emotional time for everybody, you know. Um, we had people um, in there who had blood cancer because we were doing the Leukemia Foundation um, and uh, you know, some people had lost friends and family to it, some actually were diagnosed with it, and there was one guy that actually had it at that point that was doing the trek. Um, so, we, you know, there was a lot of emotion in that whole area, and I felt absolutely like, you know, I was upset for everyone, but I was just really happy with myself. You know, I managed to actually do it. I, you know, I didn't think I could do it, but I, I did do it. And, you know, we went down and caught the train, uh, caught the bus back into into the little area and, um, you know, stopped for the night, had dinner, you know, we were in a hotel, so we actually could have a shower, which was nice. Um, and then on that fifth day, we went back in the Matrix picture and we had a good look around. Um, absolutely amazing place, I'd highly recommend it to anyone. If you're, if you're really interested in that sort of thing, it, it's worth it, it really is worth it. Um, Anyway, when we got back into Cusco uh, from the train, I just felt really low all of a sudden. I was like, you know, what's going on with depression here? Like, I'm on my tablets. You know, I was really elated the other day. Why am I suddenly down? And I was sitting on the stairs and the, and the actual team leader came over to me and said, you feel down now, don't you? And I'm like, 
yeah, what's that all about? And he said to me, oh, you know, I've, I've had my, my mental health battles too. And he said, every single time I do one of these trips and I get towards, I, you know, complete the goal that I've set, I feel down. And he said, I've, I've figured it out. It's because I've, the challenge is done. You know, I've completed what I set out to do. And he, he was right. I, I think that's what the problem was. You know, I have completed my challenge. Um, so anyway, got home um, and went back to work and I felt really disconnected even more now from you know, my workmates. I thought that this would re-energise me and would you know, get me going again. But it hadn't. And I couldn't work it out. And it was, and it was just that I had changed so much from that trek that I wanted to do something else with my life now. Something that I thought mattered more than computers and that is you know, actually getting my story out to people and showing them and saying, look, you can have these conditions, you know, you can have depression, you can have schizophrenia, all of those sort of things, but don't let it hold you back. Definitely don't let it hold you back. Get out there and keep trying because, you know, you don't know what you're actually capable of achieving until you actually do it. So, the, you know, for me now, it's, as I said, it's about getting my message out there. Um, and I'm slowly learning to do that. I'm, I hope I'm getting better and better as we go. And, um, you know, the, the few things I want, you know, people to take away from, from what I've talked about is, as obviously as, yes, you can have mental health problems, you can have depression and schizophrenia and all those sort of things. But definitely don't let them hold you back. Give it a crack. You don't know what you're capable of doing until you actually give it a try. And that was something that I never really thought. I'd always taken the easy way in life. You now computers I just fell into because I was naturally gifted at them. It didn't take any real effort. There was a talent there. Um, you know? And then I think what the Inca trial taught me is believe in yourself. Simply as that, believe in yourself because you can do it. You, you know, you're a far better person than you ever think you are. I, I know for me, I'm not the world's harshest critic for me. Okay, nobody can be as bad as I am. You know, if someone makes a mistake when I was at work, you know, that's okay, we can fix that up. But if I made that mistake, oh boy, that's it. It was on. You know, how could you be so stupid to do that? And I had to learn to tone that back myself. So yeah, look, that's that's where I wanted to, to get across to everyone today and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you.